Welcome to our channel. Today we have some of the weirdest cases. Follow us within this video to understand the case of Rachel Nichol. On the 15th of July, 1992, while walking with her young son and their dog on Wimbledon Common in London, Rachel Nichol died after suffering no fewer than 49 separate stab wounds at the hands of serial rapist Robert Knapper. Among other things, adhesive tape samples were taken from parts of her body that had been exposed during what looked like a sexually motivated attack. When these were examined for DNA by scientists at the Metropolitan Police Forensic Science Laboratory, MPFSL, the hope was that they would find male DNA that didn't match either Rachel's husband or their two-year-old son. The problem in this case was that not only did the scientists fail to find any of the male DNA they were looking for, they didn't find any DNA at all. It seems that they didn't stop to wonder why. If they had, they would have realized something was wrong because the tape should have been covered with Rachel's own DNA and skin cells. After interviewing several suspects, the attention of the Metropolitan Police focused on a local man named Colin Stagg. Convinced that Stagg was guilty, but with no real evidence to implicate him, they organized a so-called honey trap operation. For several months, an undercover policewoman feigned a romantic interest in Stagg, with the aim of getting him to confess to Rachel's murder. Ultimately, although Colin Stagg didn't ever confess to the murder, he was arrested in August 1993. A year later, at his trial at the Old Bailey, the judge excluded the entrapment evidence, the prosecution withdrew its case, and Stagg was acquitted for the crime. In 2002, when Forensic Alliance became involved in the cold case investigation into Rachel's murder, which was given the code name Operation Edsel, Angela Gallup assigned Roy Green to the case, assisted by several colleagues. Mike Gorn focused on the chemistry aspects of the case, while Claire Lowry was responsible for hairs and textile fibers. Andy McDonald took care of DNA analysis, and April Robson was appointed lead forensic examiner. The first thing we did was look at the items of clothing that had been retrieved from her and from her two-year-old son, Alex. Next, we examined the body samples and the tapings taken from her body. Semen is traditionally a good source of DNA but since the previous scientific team hadn't found any semen on Rachel's body, we anticipated that we'd be looking for smaller traces. Then, in Phase 3, we looked at various items that had been collected from the crime scene on Wimbledon Common and from some potential suspects. Later on, we added a fourth phase, which involved looking more closely at the debris the FSS had gathered from key items. To assist with the first phase of our investigation, our search for foreign DNA that could have come from Rachel's attacker, Roy set up a reconstruction experiment in the laboratory. The aim was to try and identify the specific areas of Rachel's clothes that were most likely to have been handled by her attacker. Another scientist put on clothes over a scene suit that were similar to the clothes Rachel had been wearing at the time of her attack. Then Roy, acting as the attacker, and with black powder applied to his hands, pulled and pushed them until they resembled the distribution of Rachel's clothing when her body was discovered. Residues of black powder indicated where contact had been greatest, and therefore where on her clothes we should focus our attention. Then we started work on phase two which was when we found a way in to the case. When the previous scientific teams had tested the tapings from Rachel's body, they'd used a DNA profiling test called Low Copy Number, LCN. 
LCN is a variation on the standard DNA, STR profiling, used at the time, that works by multiplying or amplifying relevant parts in small amounts of DNA until there is enough present to analyze. With LCN, 34 cycles of amplification were used, as opposed to the 28 with the standard test. Our team took a different approach. We always began with the standard, 28 cycle at that time test, so that we had a baseline of what our extracts contained in the way of DNA. We only progressed to the LCN test if we felt it was appropriate. When we looked at the tapings extract from the previous tests, what we found using the standard method of 28 cycles was a mixed profile. The major component appeared to be from Rachel herself, while some minor components were from a male. When we tested the same extract using a 34-cycle LCN technique, the equivalent of the previous test, it was clear that our reaction was over-amplified leading to an excess of DNA, and no result. Intrigued by the tiny amount of male DNA, we went back to the original intimate tapings and resampled them, creating our own extracts. We then repeated the same test as before. With some of the tapings, we got a full profile from Rachel, and although there was something else there, it wasn't confirmed by the duplicate test. With other tapings, however, even at 28 cycles we were getting a major result from Rachel and a minor result from male DNA, but not enough to identify who it might have originated from. We decided this was the ideal opportunity to take a different approach. It involved cleaning up and concentrating our sample extracts, trying to eliminate as much extraneous material such as salts and impurities as possible, because they can inhibit DNA analysis. We then tweaked the running conditions on our machines to optimize the process. Our colleagues at Orchid Cellmark undertook the bulk of this work, with Roy making sure it was done as quickly as possible, because we needed to continue to make progress with this case. In the end, it took the better part of two years. Andy McDonald then carried out some other DNA tests on our extracts from the intimate tapings in an effort to obtain as much information from them as possible. By the end of it all, we had plenty of information with which to mount a search of the National DNA Database. Roy Green had noticed at quite an early stage of the investigation that there were similarities between the modus operandi, M.O., that is, a criminal's pattern of behavior, or his or her way of committing a crime, and that of a man called Robert Knapper. Knapper had been incarcerated in Broadmoor Hospital since 1995 for the murder of another young woman and her four-year-old daughter. When the DNA extracted from the samples in our investigation was put on the National DNA Database, he came up as a match. We then began to search for more links. One of the places we looked was on some of Knapper's possessions that had remained untouched at Broadmoor since they'd been returned to him by police a few years earlier. Police investigators had apparently been particularly interested in a red-painted toolbox, about which Knapper was very protective. It was of further interest to us after we found a tiny flake of red paint and some hair combings from Rachel's son. And when Mike Gorn compared the paint flake with the paint on the toolbox, he got a match. Additionally, a layer of metal on one side of the flake was shown to be steel, which was what the toolbox was made of. We were still thinking about the crime scene and whether there was anything there that might conceivably provide a link to Napper. One of the things we considered was a couple of footwear marks that had been found in mud on a bridle path close to where Rachel had been attacked. Casts had been made out of the marks at the time, one of which was the heel of a shoe that was similar in style 
to the heel of a pair of napper's shoes, but slightly smaller in size. Since the mark was different from the suspected source, we had to find out if there was a good reason, and the only way to do this was to return to the scene and conduct an experiment. Shortly afterwards, Mike and Roy found themselves on Wimbledon Common, looking at what happened when a similar pair of shoes was used to walk over the same area of muddy ground. What they found was that the wearer of the shoes lifted his foot to take another step. A partial vacuum was created that sucked in the muddy soil around the edges of the shoe. And when they took the plaster-type casts of the marks and compared them with the shoes themselves, they showed that what was left in the mud was a slightly smaller footprint than would normally have been made by a shoe of that size. In the face of what had turned out to be overwhelming evidence, including the DNA, the paint, and the footwear mark, Robert Knapper pleaded guilty when the case went to trial. In December 2008, he was convicted of the manslaughter of Rachel Nichol on the grounds of diminished responsibility and sentenced to indefinite incarceration at Broadmoor Hospital. In the end of this video, don't forget to push the like and subscribe button for more content.